as much time as we want to. <laughs> really, I mean, uh, and, uh, if I was to give that fancy introduction that is given, I would probably end up taking all day, but I don't, I hope not to do that. It's nice to be here and I must thank Speeda for the invitation and uh, Mr. Sher Rayu Khan, CEO, Mr. Sh Mama Shivi Kanjom, Mr. Marian Sevanov, Chief Director of the SME Development in Bulgaria and Dr. Navida Kachera, the Dean of the uh, School of Business, UMT. With your permission, ladies and gentlemen, I, I thought to myself that what, what should one speak about I'm sure you've we'll been hearing a lot about SMEs, their contribution to the national economy, 40% of the GDP, 40% of the exports, being over 90% of the total businesses in the country. Uh, I'm sure a lot has been said about that and the constraints that they face. Uh, what I wanted to speak today about, and uh, I'll leave you with those thoughts, is the overall environment or the landscape in which these uh, SMEs work, uh, and uh, which is the domestic markets because regardless of the 40% exports, most of these enterprises do most of their businesses in the domestic markets. And that is what I'd like to focus on today. Um, it's a, I think the first, the starting point of course is that we must realize uh, that it's difficult, if not totally impossible, and this is something that uh, both in our project, the SME project um, that I work with and uh, the previous projects that one did, uh, we've been saying this repeatedly that the first realization of course is that if you really want to capture international markets, your own domestic markets have to be competitive. If you're, if you're working in distorted, uncompetitive markets, it's not very likely that you're going to shine brightly in the international field. And then from there we must want to realize that the Pakistani domestic markets are really not that competitive. They are distorted and there are a number of distortions that they face from and there are a number of problems that they face. Uh, this is a little unfortunate because if you take a look at uh, the history of commerce and enterprise in this part of the world, there has been a huge historical connectivity and international linkages. I know it is not the favor of the month to speak well of colonialism, but uh, the colonial experience is in a way a modernizing experience. And enterprises in this part of the world develop international linkages rather really. Uh, largely as vendors perhaps, largely as producers of raw material for the industries making more money out there. But the fact is that those kind of uh, the markets were modernized because of the colonial experience and some manner of international linkages were developed. Uh, the other thing of course is that in this country at least, there has been no major disruption or discontinuum. I realize that there was uh, a brush with nationalism, uh, but it did not really affect the small and medium enterprises that much. Uh, and whatever restrictions have been placed have largely not been restrictions on business per se, but more restrictions rooted in the public good. Notions of price controls, notions of uh, seeing that business did not become exploited. Of course, at one level that is good, things like monopoly control, for example. Uh, but the, any restrictions that have come around on small business enterprises have largely been, been rooted in the government's own notions of what is good for the public. Uh, not necessarily true, but that is what governments do. Uh, they think they know everything. And, and believe me, I know. I have worked long enough in government to know that. Uh, so, uh, the other thing of course, going for our markets is that there's a great, uh, huge local markets and a growing middle class. And, and as we look around us, we can see uh, the vibrancy in our markets. So that is a huge factor going forward. Then of course there's certain self-sufficiencies. There's a labor self-sufficiency, perhaps not that well skilled, we'll talk about that later. But there is enough labor to go around, not very really expensive too. And uh, there are some number of skills, perhaps not adequate, like I said, but some skills do exist and we have most of the raw material that we need. And coupled with this, this country is fortunate to have a very good transport network. Uh, and, this, and not only that, but it also has a certain amount of interprovincial freedom. Uh, there was a study done some years back, I guess, it's now 18 years back, uh, by the, it was sponsored by the World Bank, 
which looked at uh, the convergence of regional incomes. And it found it, it took a look at two countries, the ten countries, and the two which stood out were the United States and Pakistan. And, uh, and the reason given was that there was no restriction on factor mobility. People could move, businesses could move between various provinces. And so that too is a big advantage. There are no such restrictive controls, uh, whether we interpret into movements of goods and services. Uh, but so what are the features of our local markets? Well, we all recognize this is the second day of this conference, so we know that local markets are largely SME based. About 90% we are told of all enterprises are SMEs, um, though we do not really have strict data on this. That is another issue. Uh, this absence of immaculate data, but still uh, we know that 90%, over 90% of all enterprises are SMEs. Uh, this has huge advantages. SMEs have quicker turnaround uh, times, they can respond quickly to market needs, they can respond quicker to export needs, but this also has disadvantages. Um, the, the first impact disadvantage, of course, is that there has been a certain amount of reluctance or incapacity to move up the ladder. There are, we are marked by low rates of uh, mergers or consolidations, for instance. Uh, so this uh, developing the right economies of scale remains an issue. Uh, so this, this really has its own inbuilt uh, problems. Uh, the main reason, of course, is that a greater number of these enterprises are in the informal sector. Again, we cannot specifically say that this many enterprises are in the informal sector, but this is for sure uh, that a large number of our, our enterprises remain in the informal sector. And uh, the reasons, of course, too are uh, very well known. It's the high cost of doing business, uncertain tax regimes, uh, compliance nuisances. So these, when they combine, really are a big disincentive to, form a, to formalize yourself. It is far safer to remain below the regard and continue doing what you're doing, but then you'll have to face the consequences. You close ownerships, you will not be open to more greater equity participations. Uh, you will have uh, limited access to capital because you will not be able to access formal markets. And of course, your management practices will remain restrictive and not very dynamic. So that, that marks the informal sector and remains a problem. Another feature, of course, is the lack of corporatization. And I say this knowing full well what I'm saying. Even formal industry or formal enterprises in our country are reluctant to really adopt the corporate mode of management. The best of them, except for the multinationals, remain like family enterprises. Uh, you know, the sun can walk in any time and become the MD. So, and that, that remains the hallmark of most of our, even the fancier enterprises that we have. So they run like family enterprises. They do not really adopt the corporate culture as we know it. Multinationals do, but not most of our local enterprises. Uh, the other thing we must recognize, of course, is today, and this was, this was even before the 18th Amendment, but it has become much more marked after the 18th Amendment, is that most enterprises and working in domestic markets uh, are now virtually domestic markets, are greatly a provincial domain. Uh, it's less the federal government and more the provincial governments which uh, are responsible for the policy and regulatory domains. And uh, whether it is because of uh, historical reluctance or historical lack of capacity or uh, this provincial government historically not thinking that commerce and trade is their basic uh, function, so to speak, uh, we, it's, uh, we see very clearly that there is a certain amount of policy vacuum within set in certain sectors. There are also, and the regulatory frameworks are skewed. They are designed for what the provincial government think is an essential function. Their own notions of public welfare, price controls, labor, labor welfare. This, are, this is not a statement against labor welfare, but the government's own notions of what it needs to do about these things. So it is not surprising uh, that uh, given this kind of uh, notion of the government's paternalistic role, the Maiwa role, as the colonials understood it, uh, most uh, of our policies end up in really earmarking a much greater role for government 
than they should be. And there is resultantly a very huge uh, footprint of, uh, of, of the public sector in a lot of domestic markets and domains. I could give you endless examples. I could give you examples of policy vacuums. I could give you examples of uh, distorted regulatory frameworks. Clear example, of course, is the agriculture marketing laws and policies, which are still rooted in the notions of of the 1930s or 40s fans and hardly designed for modern dynamic agriculture marketing. Similarly, so many others. You'd, you'd be surprised to know that uh, the basic law which governs the spinning sector was actually promulgated in 1925. And the entire regulatory regimes as far as spinning go are focused more on the right of protection than efficient spinning. Uh, this, and so many other examples can be given. Uh, if you take a look at the livestock sector, there's such a huge footprint of the public sector that there's virtually no scope for the private sector to enter the, and operate. Only local governments can put up repertoires. Uh, only local governments can put up uh, livestock markets. Uh, it's the government group which goes around inoculating livestock and providing medicines. Uh, you and I can go out and buy a medicine made by the private sector but all medicines in the veterinary sector are supplied by the public sector. So there's a huge, huge uh, public footprint in a lot of these sectors. Uh, so, uh, what, again, this, this has also led to a lot of unnecessary regulation, uh, and it has led to compliance regimes which are restrictive and which lead to informal, which lead actually to renting behavior. So it's not surprising to see that even the public good that these uh, regulations were supposed to promote has hardly been delivered on. Uh, the other feature that one could talk about is the absence of domestic standards for goods and services. And that's, that is something which uh, really is a uh, retardant as far as good business goes or, or really good dynamic open competitive markets go. Uh, there is also, if we take a look at it, going on to the other feature of domestic markets, a bit of a disconnect between market requirements or the requirements of enterprises and industry and the labor markets which are likely to be organized. So you just view, when you take a look at skills training or how the skill sets are being met, you find that there's a big, big, big disconnect between the demand and the supply. Most of our training or skill development is supply based rather than demand driven. Is a supply side function. The other feature that one could talk about is the absence of consumer protection base, but largely the consumer protection based on the transparent and non distorted compliance regimes. Uh, rather than invest in such systems, although the uh, start was made some time back, governments have largely relied on control. Rather than protecting consumers in a manner which is good for business and good for the consumer, so we have people going around trying to control prices or to impose limitations which are going to distort the market and not even do the consumer much good. Uh, there's so many examples that one could give. Uh, now, faced with all this, one would have thought that enterprises in our country would develop the right kind of response. And what is that response? The response is good trade bodies. Good trade bodies organized to provide information, trade bodies organized to do a bit of research, uh, trade bodies organized to do advocacy to change the regulatory frameworks and to provide the right kind of policy direction. Uh, but that too is missing. SMEs particularly really do not act. I said this to you, to the uh, chamber representative here, but you find that our chambers really do not speak in the voice of the SMEs and the SMEs uh, in that sense, not only poorly represented, but actually do not have a voice in a lot of the forums where it matters. And uh, with the result that we have trade bodies which end up working more as lobbyists than as actual promoters of the uh, enterprises and the sectors that they represent. Um, why we have one to also talk about the low technology that uh, exists in our country. You would find that we are at times rather happy most of our enterprises of working at a level which is uh, which is perhaps not 
state of the art might not be needed, but which is not even one step below state of the art. And mostly we are relying on technology which we sort of mend as we go along and uh, in a very uh, haphazard manner. So the level of technology that is available in domestic markets or in domestic enterprises also is not uh, what it should be if we look at competitive or internationally competitive markets. Now after having talked about all these features which tend to really give a more of a uh, negative picture of domestic markets, uh, you could well say then what is the way forward? Where do we go from here? I think firstly it's important uh, that the public sector, the governments, in this case the provincial governments and the federal government, uh, that they should have very clear, preferably sector-specific policies. So that everybody knows what the direction is, all stakeholders have been consulted, and everybody's pulling in the same direction. That is important. The second thing, which to my mind is very important, is to reform the distorted regulatory and compliance regimes and reduce the cost of doing business. I don't really, I'm sure somewhere along the line, uh, the, our ranking in the ease of doing business must have been quoted in this uh, conference, uh, but uh, we are not really doing too well when we look at, uh, it is the cost of doing business in this country is fairly high. Uh, the third thing to do would be to invest in knowledge building and standardization. That is a task which looks to be important and which needs to be taken up. Uh, Four, to my mind, would be to encourage greater formalization. Uh, I think the push here has to be to incentivize formalization rather than to choose a more coercive ways of getting people to uh, formalize or to start paying taxes or whatever. Uh, you have to find a way of incentivizing formalization and encouraging people towards consolidation of mergers. Um, the fifth, to my mind, very clearly, and that stems for from our, our growth from our experience with our major sector is the need to wean off industry from unnecessary supports and subsidies. That has never done any good. You might have read, been reading in the press that we have now decided because of the huge wheat stocks that we've got unnecessarily, let me say, uh, we've now decided to subsidize wheat export. Uh, the, the other news which has come out is that there are a number of countries which have stated very clearly that if we were to do that, we would we were likely to look at uh, dispute uh, panels and we were likely to look at WTO action against us. Uh, so it's very important if we are to become internationally competitive that we now learn to live. Firstly, that the support that is provided is such which will make them more competitive and secondly, make sure that there are less subsidies and that we wean them off as quickly as possible. The sixth thing to, which to my mind is very, very important is reducing the government footprint and creating greater space for the for private sector to work. I just have to look at sectors like livestock, which I talked about, and a number of others. I now notice that the Punjab government is actively also providing its own IT services through PITV. That is not what PITV was meant to do. PITV was meant to promote the private sector, create the right kind of space within the public sector for the private sector to do that work. So those are the kind of things that governments must learn to do. They have to promote the private sector, they have to create space for the private sector. And these kind of brownfields where the government is itself the business provider, or, or in a sense the market, become very good. And they are the short businesses and if the livestock sector was to open, I'm sure uh, there would be a lot of good business uh, that would take place. And then of course is the whole business of using access to finance, uh, in which again, it's not just making uh, the capital markets more responsive to SME needs, which is being done to an extent, the state bank is very conscious of this, uh, but also to make sure that the government does not continually squeeze out the private sector from the capital markets. <laughs> so it's all huge boring, I don't know how that is going to happen, but that has to happen sooner or later. Um, so, and finally, we have to reduce the cost of doing business. Uh, there are huge entry and exit costs which have to come down. I've already talked about cumbersome compliance regimes, complicated tax regimes, unpredictable, and uh, lack of contract enforcement, which is a huge problem. At times, small enterprises spend 
nearly as much money as their entire capital uh, on just getting a single contract enforced. Uh, and uh, that's a very high cost. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be done. I'm sure this conference has indicated a number of ways in which it can be done. And also the key stakeholders and players have been identified. I would just uh, end on a note of hope. Uh, the project that I'm associated with, the SMEA, uh, the Small and Medium Enterprise Activity of the USA, is actively involved in trying to improve the business enabling environment and reduce the cost of uh, business. We are very proud that we are assisting FRIDA in the development of the new SME policy, uh, which you must have heard about, uh, subcontracted to the Consortium for Development and Policy Research. And I think the team lead was here, uh, Professor Kodal, yesterday and spoke in one of the sessions. And that is very good work being done. But we are helping uh, all the provinces develop investment policies, which will focus largely on removing these constraints, focus on improving regulatory frameworks, making tax, at least the provincial tax regimes more predictable, and a number of other things. So a lot is happening, but a lot still needs to be done. And I think this conference will go a long way in making that happen. And I congratulate Smira for organizing it and for giving me the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much.